Hello and welcome to this clip introducing um, carbonyl derivatives. We're going to focus on acyl chlorides and acid anhydrides because they're in your specification. Uh, carboxylic acids and esters are also considered carbonyl derivatives but they're covered in a separate clip. Uh, we'll introduce to you the nucleophilic addition elimination mechanism. Uh, this is not actually required in detail for your examination but um, an, a passing awareness of what it means um, in terms of the reactions of these particular carbonyl derivatives is important to, to grasp. Um, the curly arrows and the dipoles that go with it um, are not required, like I've just said, but uh, I have done a separate clip, if you're curious and interested, uh, that goes into that level of detail. But yet again, I just repeat myself here, it's, uh, it's simply for extension purposes only. So throughout this clip, I'm assuming that you've covered the basics of carbonyl chemistry surrounding aldehydes and ketones. Here we've got a range of carbonyl derivatives. Some of them are on your specification, and uh, some of them are not. Um, the carboxylic acid, carboxylate, and ester um, will be covered in a separate uh, video clip, as will amides. Uh, thioesters and acyl phosphates are not on your specification. So with that in mind, the only ones we'll really be looking at are acyl chlorides and acid and hydrides. It's worth pointing out as well that in each case they contain the carbonyl group, which is simply just C double bond O. But they won't behave as true carbonyl compounds, i.e. they won't react with 2,4-DNP, and uh, they won't react with Tollens reagent, because basically what's happening is that the other atom that's bonded to the carbon atom in C double bond O is uh, too electronegative to allow the polarity of the C double bond O to remain as it was. In other words, if you look closely, you'll see that you've got things like oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, etc., chlorine. All of these are electronegative atoms compared to carbon, and they will um, affect the polarity of the C double bond O. So I've highlighted all the carbon atoms that I'm talking about. So they're all part of a C double bond O, which itself is polar, but they're also attached or bonded to another electronegative atom, which will also draw electron density towards itself. So the behaviour of the C double bond O is affected. So the reactivity of a carbonyl based functional group depends very much on the electronegativity of the atom bonded to the carbon atom in the C double bond O and how therefore this affects the polarity of the C double bond O. So looking at two examples you've got an aldehyde on the left where the C double bond O is clearly polar and an acyl chloride on the right, where you also have the polarity of the C single bond chlorine. So therefore, the uh, polarity of the C double bond O on the right-hand functional group is disrupted. And this brings us to another functional group that I want to cover in this clip. So what we're going to look at now, specifically, are the acid anhydrides and the acid chlorides. These are actually called acyl chlorides on our specification. So it's probably worth pointing that out um, for the purpose of this clip. So looking at the structures of both of these types of compounds, the trigonal planar shape um, with 120 degree round angle exists around the carbon double bond oxygen in both cases. But in the acid, acid anhydrides, uh, the central oxygen that sits between the two carbonyl groups um, carries a 104.5 degrees bond angle. When you're naming them, in each case you use the R group or R groups, whether they're alkyl or aromatic. Uh, you include the carbon with the carbon double bond oxygen. So for acyl chlorides, the name always ends in oil chloride, not oil chloride or oil chloride. So let me give you a couple of examples. So you've got propanoyl chloride, methanoyl chloride, and in the case of the third one where there's two acyl chloride groups at each end, you'd have butane dioyl chloride. Not forgetting, of course, an aromatic version like benzoyl chloride. So for acid anhydride, the name will end in anoic anhydride in the same way as you have ethanoic acid or propanoic acid, for example. So when we're naming acid anhydrides, or drawing the structural formula for them, rather. The R groups 
and the carbonyls are placed in brackets. So I've highlighted them on the structure and I've also highlighted them within the structural formula. So if both of the R groups are identical, as in ethanoic anhydride, you can just put one of them in brackets and double it up by putting two next to it, like I've placed here. If they're different from each other, then you have to put them in separate brackets, like in the second example called methanoic propanoic anhydride, and not forgetting the aromatic versions phenyl ethanoic anhydride as well. In order to prepare an acyl chloride, what you need to do is use a special reagent called thionyl chloride. And you react this with a carboxylic acid, as shown. And that gives you ethanol chloride, sulfur dioxide gas and hydrogen chloride gas. Uh, quite a toxic cocktail of products there, so um, it's not really one that we do in the lab at any level. But it is possible to do this quite reliably um, at university and professional level chemistry to produce ethanol chloride or other acyl chlorides. So to prepare an acid anhydride, all you need to do is to um, dehydrate two molecules of an, uh, carboxylic acid. So looking at ethanoic acid, making ethanoic anhydride. So looking at the, the displayed formulae, um, not fully displayed of course, but <clears throat> partially displayed, you can see clearly where the water comes from. And obviously this reaction could be reversed as well. If you were to add water to a, uh, an acid anhydride, you would hydrolyze it and split it into the two parent molecules of um, carboxylic acid. It's actually quite a vigorous reaction, but it's not quite as vigorous as the reaction between water and an acyl chloride. So we'll look at this comparison in a little bit more detail on the next slide. So we're going to cover the acid anhydride group as well. Uh, an interesting uh, side feature of this particular functional group, although it's very reactive, it's not quite as reactive as the um, acyl chloride group. And in the acyl chloride group's reaction, almost invariably it gives off uh, toxic HCl gas as a side product. So it's not only more exothermic and difficult to control, but it also has a dangerous side product. So an, on an industrial scale, and in professional laboratories, if faced with the choice, quite often chemists will use acid anhydrides instead because they're slightly safer and easier to work with. So here's a summary page of all the reactions of these two particular types of compounds. The first thing to do, I suppose, is to have a look at the main reaction at the top of each column. And just to make a note of the products that you get, with an acyl chloride it reacts with a nucleophile, I've written the nucleophile as NU, and I've included the lone pair to signify its role as a nucleophile. And I've also attached to the nucleophile a hydrogen atom because this becomes involved in the mechanism. So with an acyl chloride you get an organic product where the nucleophile has replaced the chlorine atom, and you also get hydrogen chloride as a side product. With the acid and hydride you have the same situation except this time, you have a similar organic addition product to what you would have got with the acyl chloride, except the remainder of the acid anhydride group is uh, combined with the proton that's lost from the HNU um, molecule to make a carboxylic acid. So just to highlight where the protons came from, this proton ends up here, and this proton ends up here. I also wanted to say a brief word about the mechanism. I'm just going to mention it in passing because it's a new one that we haven't come across yet. It's not actually on our syllabus as something you have to know about in terms of the curly arrows and the dipoles, but it's useful to have a quick chat about it just so we know what's happening. So the nucleophile, in this case the NU with the lone pair, adds to the carbon of the carbonyl group. Remembering, of course, that the carbonyl group is polar. So I've added in all the dipoles just for illustrative purposes, but the key point here is that the carbon in the C double bond O is susceptible for nucleophilic attack. In the second stage, 
a leaving group of some kind is eliminated. And the first stage is where the nucleophile adds on to the carbon atom to create the product that we've got here and here. So that bond is made, and at the same time, a leaving group comes off. The leaving group was whatever was on, on there to start with, and that's bonded to the hydrogen that we just talked about, the hydrogen that's attached to the nucleophile. So starting with the reaction with alcohols, what I've done here is I've put in the lone pairs and kind of overemphasized them a little bit so you can see that the alcohol is behaving as a nucleophile because the oxygen atom possesses a lone pair. In each case you get an ester and you get the expected side product. If we now move on to the reaction with water as a nucleophile, from now on I'm not going to put the lone pairs in because I'm assuming that you're happy that they're there. So the lone pairs on the oxygen of the water molecule will mean that it can behave as a nucleophile. And in the case of uh, the acyl chloride, we get carboxylic acid and RHCl. With the acid anhydride, you get two carboxylic acid molecules. So what's happening here is essentially the acid anhydride, which is really two carboxylic acid molecules joined together with a loss of water, um, is turned back into its two carboxylic acid molecules by adding water to it. Moving on to the phenols, then we have to remember that the, the oxygen on the OH in the phenol has uh, originally two lone pairs, but if you remember back to your work on phenols, one of the lone pairs is delocalized into the pi system. So that leaves a lone pair remaining, which I am going to highlight here. So that lone pair means that the phenol can behave as a nucleophile in this reaction. As you can see, you get an aromatic ester in each case, and the side product is, as you'd expect, HCl and carboxylic acid. With ammonia, the interesting thing to note here is you have two moles of ammonia for every one mole of um, acyl chloride, or an, an acid anhydride. Uh, you produce an amide in each case, two moles uh, with an acid anhydride and one mole with a um, acyl chloride. The side product is also different, isn't it? If you look, you've got an, an ammonium chloride being produced instead of HCl, and you've got water being produced instead of a carboxylic acid. It's a similar story that you get at the bottom with the primary amine. Uh, this time what happens is you get an N-substituted amide. We call this an N-substituted amide because the nitrogen atom and the amide actually has an R group that uh, used to be on the amine. So the amine has an R group and that R group ends up uh, substituted onto the nitrogen in the amide. So we call it an N-substituted amide. You also get an, uh, an analogous um, structure to the ammonium chloride. You get an alkyl ammonium salt, it's called this time. It's basically an NH3 with an R group attached, making the whole thing positively charged, so it's, atta it's attracted to a chloride ion that comes off the um, acyl chloride. So an alkyl ammonium salt is what you get in that particular case. So now let's have a look at an example of a uh, past exam question that uh, delves into some of these reactions and asks you to try and apply them uh, in a deductive manner. So let's now have a go at an exam question. This one is uh, about two or three screens long, it's a fairly long one. Um, it's uh, to do with medicine. Obviously you've got aspirin and paracetamol, two commonly known um, headache remedies. And uh, it might be quite good to try and apply some of the stuff we've talked about, some of the reactions we've talked about, um, to uh, an applied exam question. So it gives you um, the structures of aspirin and paracetamol, so you can see quite clearly the functional groups. It also gives you three reactions that are examples of ethanoic anhydride. So in reaction one, the ethanoic anhydride is reacting with an alcohol. In reaction two, it's reacting with an amine. And in reaction 3, it's reacting with an alcohol. So then it says, draw the structure of a compound that could react with ethanoic anhydride to form aspirin. 
So aspirin is obviously the one on the left. And hopefully what you can spot is that you've got part of ethanoic anhydride there. Because that's what we looked at a couple of screens ago. But if our ethanoic anhydride is going to react to form aspirin, the compound needs to contain what's actually highlighted in blue. So our compound could look something like that. That actually is called salicylic acid, but you don't have to know that for this particular um, uh, for this particular question. But it happens to be called salicylic acid. Clearly, you can see that it's got the phenol group in it, so it's a phenol that reacts with ethanoic anhydride. So in this next part of the question, it asks you about ethanoic anhydride and uh, paracetamol. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, just to give you a bit of technique here. Um, because you'd have to flick back over the page in your exam to look at these structures, I've actually drawn paracetamol here so we've got something to work with. I've also drawn ethanoic anhydride and I'm also going to draw um, for aminophenol. So all these, although these aren't actually part of the answer I'm going to put in, I've put them around the side so that I can try and visualise how to do my equation. So the question asked me to write an equation showing structural formulae. I've added a little hint there to not use molecular formulae because they've specifically said that they want structural formulae. Now, the thing about structural formulae when we're looking at aromatic compounds is that you can actually put the benzene ring drawn as a hexagon with the circle inside it as part of your structural formula. So I start off with, with my 4 amino phenol and my um, ethanoic anhydride. Notice the ethanoic anhydride has actually been drawn in structural form and so has the side product of ethanoic acid on the other side. Remember when we looked at the reactions of um, ethanoic anhydride, one part of it ends up being uh, uh, reacting with the, um, the reactant and the other part ends up being uh, put uh, on the side of the products as a as a side product, CH3COOH. So in this case, one half of it ends up reacting with the um, with the 4 amino phenol. Remember, the 4 amino phenol can react as a nucleophile because the nitrogen has a lone pair. Uh, so therefore, the 4 amino phenol reacts with the ethanoic anhydride, and one half of it, the part I'm highlighting now, ends up in the paracetamol. And the other half of it, which is already highlighted on the right-hand side, ends up as CH3COOH. So that's a two-mark question because it took a little bit of thinking, perhaps, to construct that in your mind. So this next part asks you to deduce the structure of an impurity that's also formed. Now you only have the molecular formula C10H11NO3 to go with. The way I'd suggest using this is that C6H5 would actually be a benzene ring. So if we draw a benzene ring in, like so, and we bonded it to something, that takes care of C6H5 at least out of your C10H11NO3. I can add a nitrogen on, because there's only one place the nitrogen would have come from, and that would be the 4-aminophenol. If you want to double-check the 4-aminophenol, it's still up in the top right-hand corner of the screen. There's only one nitrogen in C10H11NO3, so there's no reason to assume it's still not bonded to the benzene ring. If you look at the reaction we've just drawn above in part BI, only one of the hydrogens on the NH2 was actually replaced with something else. So the other hydrogen can stay where it is. So that's why I've added that in there. So now if we look at what we've got, we've got 10 carbons, 6 of which we've used up. So we have 4 carbons left. So also remembering that ethanoic anhydride splits in half when it reacts. We can now put the two halves of ethanoic anhydride um, on either side of this molecule. And also remembering that the benzene ring was originally part of 4 amino phenol, I've drawn in red what the original 4 amino phenol, um, the, the, the remnants of the original 4 amino phenol 
So now what I can do is I can switch colours and draw in the remainder that will come from the ethanoic anhydride. So if you can now see that the red part would have been what was left of the 4-aminophenol and the black part is what would have come from the ethanol anhydride. So checking our numbers, we've got 6 carbons in the benzene ring and 2 carbons either side of it as part of the ethanoic anhydride. So that's the C10 ticked. We have uh, 6 hydrogens split between two methyl groups. We have an H on the nitrogen, that's seven hydrogens, and we have a further four on the benzene ring in these locations. So that takes care of our hydrogens, and we also can now clearly see that we've got one nitrogen and three oxygens, so that's the NO3 taken care of as well. So that part was quite deductive, wasn't it? It was reasonably difficult, um, but if you take it piece by piece and think about the fact that you've already thought a little bit about what happens to ethanoic anhydride, if you correctly put the equation down for part I, then in part II it shouldn't be too difficult to stretch it a bit and see if you can come up with a structure that might work. So now let's move the page up and have another look at the rest of the question. So it says, explain why it's necessary for pharmaceutical companies to ensure that drugs and medicines are pure. There's only one mark here, so this would be probably something to do with safety and patient safety. So we say something along the lines of no, in, uh, no harmful side effects. So I'm going to draw out aspirin and paracetamol so you can do the next part of the question. Uh, it's just to name the functional groups pre present. So in the paper, what you'd be doing is flicking back to the original part of the question that has these structures printed for you. So for the purposes of this clip, I've popped them down at the bottom. So it should be fairly straightforward now to work out what's there. So we'd have an ester and a carboxylic acid for aspirin, and an amide and a phenol for paracetamol. So onto the third page of the question, and this time, to make things convenient for you, the exam board have repr reprinted the aspirin and paracetamol structures. Um, so what we're going to do is to have a look at the whole page so you can see the kind of thing we're being asked to do. So it says a student carried out some reactions with samples of aspirin and paracetamol in the laboratory and their structure is repeated below and the student tried to react. Notice it doesn't mean they successfully reacted, they tried to react. Each of the reagents A, B and C with aspirin and paracetamol. So A reacted with, with aspirin and with paracetamol so that means that whatever reagent A is, it reacts with something that aspirin and paracetamol both possess. And then reagent B reacted only with aspirin, and reagent C reacted only with paracetamol. So that would mean focus on their differences in the cases of B and C. So for reagent A, you need to think of something that will react with uh, the most reactive parts of paracetamol and aspirin. So you've got a carboxylic acid in one, and you've got the OH of a phenol in the other. Both of these functional groups will actually react with sodium or sodium hydroxide. So either of those two will react with the two highlighted functional groups. So the organic product with aspirin would be that compound, where the hydrogen has been taken off the COO to, and replaced with sodium to form a sodium salt of aspirin. And moving the page down, the organic product with paracetamol, having another quick look at it again, so it's the phenol end that would react, and again you get a sodium salt in the same way. So to help with this part, I've popped paracetamol and aspirin structures again off of the page for you. I put a couple of hints at each side, so you need to remember that B only reacts with aspirin, and C only reacts with paracetamol. So what you're going to do is cast your mind back to what do phenols do, as opposed to what do carboxylic acids do. Aspirin can be seen as a carboxylic acid. 
paracetamol can be seen as a phenol. So if we look at the bottom, carboxylic acid, phenol. So sodium carbonate or sodium hydrogen carbonate as weak bases won't react with phenols, but they will react with the carboxylic acid. So let's have a look at what you get. Interestingly, exactly the same compound as you get before, but for a different reason. This time the sodium will be coming from sodium carbonate and not sodium hydroxide or sodium metal. But this time you'd have bromine because phenols easily brominate on the aromatic ring if you cast your mind back to our work on phenols. So therefore this time it's a completely different reagent. So the position of the bromine can go anywhere on the phenol, uh, sorry, on the phenol aromatic ring because of the extra electron density afforded to it, uh, that is the ring, by the lone pair on the oxygen of the OH on the phenol. So now let's have a quick run through the Mark scheme so we can see some of the um, alternative answers we could have gone with. So going back to the beginning, our cell acetic acid was the correct answer. And there's different ways of writing it. You could write structural or displayed. Uh, but be careful to not have the wrong bond linkage. So you can see carefully here, the incorrect bond linkages would be there, there, and there. So notice in the equation for the reaction between formine and phenol and ethanoic anhydride, our ethanoic anhydride and our CH3COH product at the end were written in structural form as we were as we were expected to do. You could write everything in structural form if you wished, but I would find it probably a little bit easier from your point of view as a student maybe to write it with the benzene rings because then you can see the positioning of everything. Notice they don't allow molecular formulae, so that's why I said don't look at them, don't try and use them in the beginning. So we used this version. There is an alternative version underneath that you could go for if you wanted, provided it has um, C10H11NO3. And you've got some possible ways of writing the amide or the ester groups as well. We talked about no harmful side effects. Uh, there's also the idea of effectiveness. Impurities will reduce effectiveness of the drug dosage, or they might be toxic. So there's several different ways you can say the same idea. Um, dangerous or nasty or can kill or increase dosage are a little bit irrelevant. That's whether they're ignore, they're ignore or not wrong. They just don't quite cut it in terms of the detail and the specificity that's required at this level. We got the ester and the carboxylic acid. We got the amide and the phenol. Notice that they say and. You have to get both in each case, not just one. So if you got one of them but not the other, I'm afraid it's no marks. Um, it's not an amine, it's not just acid, it's a carboxylic acid, it's not a hydroxide, it's not an alcohol, because phenols are quite different from hydroxides or alcohols. And amides are different from amines. So we said that we were allowed sodium or sodium hydroxide. Either of those would actually give you the same product because it's the sodium that's reacting in the form of Na+. So you can see quite clearly on the structures that Na+, replaces H in each case. So in the top, the Na+, replaces the H in the carboxylic acid. And in the bottom, it replaces the H in the phenol. So for aspirin only, we talked about NaHCO3 or Na2CO3. I mentioned weak bases. So technically a metal oxide could do it as well because that's a weak base. But generally we use uh, hydrogen carbonates or carbonates as our weak bases. Because what happens when you react them with a phenol, uh, sorry, with a carboxylic acid, I beg your pardon. When you react them with a carboxylic acid, they give off carbon dioxide, which is a visible um, observation you can make. Metal oxides react, but you can't easily tell because they just produce um, water and the salt. The carbon dioxide is effervescence that you can see, so we generally stick to um, talking about hydrogen carbonates or carbonates to test for carboxylic acids.
for paracetamol only, it's bromine, and it says here you can allow one or more BR at any position on the ring. You mustn't substitute the bromine for the OH because it doesn't react with the OH, it reacts with the actual benzene ring itself, the pi system within the ring. There's other options you can use, um, acyl chloride, acid anhydride and corresponding ester. Um, they're not specifically required for this question, but they are chemically feasible in this particular case. Uh, diazonium, if you're watching this video before we've started doing azo dyes, don't worry too much about diazonium yet, because it's a separate topic. But So it's worth pointing out at this stage that uh, azo dyes and diazotization is not a new specification. This is a previous specifications um, question. Um, so it's chemically legitimate, obviously. Um, they wouldn't put it in if it wasn't but it's just not needed for the specification we're doing at this particular time. So hopefully this has been a reasonably useful clip. Um, it's a little, little bit longer than some of them perhaps, but um, there was a fair few things to cover and to go over. But uh, if you have any queries, please jot them down, bring them into one of us at college, maybe pop into a subject extension or have a chat to your teacher. But uh, for the meantime, thanks for your time and uh, bye for now.